Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, to the Vice Chancellor, Professor Mashum Khalo, the Deputy Vice Chancellors, Dean of Students, MEC of Health, students, and the entire University of Limpopo community. Let me cordially welcome you to my presence. I am content to greet all of you as the head and also on the behalf of the University of Limpopo TSRC and the hosts also of this virtual lecture. I wish to also welcome the MEC of Health in Limpopo, Dr. Popira Matuba, and the university community at large. We are all gathered here virtually, finding ourselves having a public lecture in second wave of COVID-19 and vaccine rollout plan. On behalf of the massive ULTSRC, we urge you to listen attentively with intentions of learning as the dynamics of COVID evolves every day and proper knowledge is one of the tools we can use to conquer against the virus. It has been a thorny year for all humanity. We are all grappling with the challenge of COVID-19, but we are also proud as the student representatives to be in the hours of concluding the academic year 2020. Mr. Program Director Somo, also allow me also to convey words of comfort for the students and families who lost their loved ones due to the virus by lending a verse from the Bible, the second book of Corinthians, chapter one, verse three. As I conclude, remember to always wear your mask sanitize your hands and maintain social distancing. As we continue finding solutions for Africa, I welcome you all to the floor. Uh, my name is Tibel Losomo, and um, I'm a member of the TSRC responsible for specifically the portfolio of um, Faculty of Health Sciences, Gender and Health, work, well, gender health and Wellness, as well as uh, Culture and Religion. Um, my apologies, but I will be taking over as the program director for the day. Um, without any further wasting of time, let me take this opportunity to allow um, the VC, Vice Chancellor of the University of Limpopo, Professor Marco Mohalong, to just give a um, few weeks of support to the TSRC in this uh, program so that we also feel most welcome just after the TSRC chairperson has said her few words that we, com we, are complete, uh, we are complete in moving forward with the program. Um, I'm not going to waste any time, like I said. Um, I'll just request the, the Vice Chancellor uh, Professor Matum Mohalong to just um, give you a few words of support um, in this program. Uh, the VC. Thank you, Program Director. Firstly, let me thank and congratulate the TSRC for this noble idea, for saying, as a community, could we come together and share ideas and ways of comfort and ways of encouragement which uh, would be coming from the Honorable MEC Popira Matua who is in charge of health services in the province of Limpopo. I don't think you could have chosen any relevant person other than our Honorable MEC to come and share with us, inform us and guide us on how to deal with this. She, she has done so quite a number of times and uh, the results of her effort are there for all of us to see. Once more, Honorable MEC, thanks for the good work you are doing. 
the COVID pandemic, I think we are all aware. It has been with us now. We are into the second year and the second wave. When it started and the president of the country declared a state of disaster, we never thought it would get to this. But here we are, we're still reeling in it. We went through the first wave. Little did we know that we're going to go through the second wave, which will be even a bit harsher than the first wave. When it started, we used to listen to the news, listen to the MEC, listen to those in authority, talking of the numbers of people infected and those who succumb to the virus. Later, we all got affected. Affected in that it was no longer just numbers. These numbers had names. And the names were names of people we know. And that's what was most traumatic to everybody. And that's why I agree with you, TSRC, that as a university community, we pay our sincere condolences to the families who lost their loved ones. The university, it's part of the community and we are no exception. And we know the pain brought about by the virus. It affected us. We tried everything possible to make sure we don't lose the 2020 academic year. With our resolve as the university that we'll do everything possible to make sure that no student is left behind. We'll make everything sure that every student is given a fair opportunity to complete the academic year. Here we are. We did manage to complete the 2020 academic year. And we are preparing, using our past experiences, and ready to tackle the 2021 academic year. And I'm sure even there, we're going to succeed. Program director said I must use a few words. I think I'm used, I used more than you bargained for. But let me take this opportunity to welcome the MEC, Ms. Dr. Popira Matuba, to address us. Mulepo, um, the MEC doesn't need any introduction. She could have gotten that uh, position through a raise of hands, but she's in the right field. A medical doctor by profession and a scholar of note in that uh, she, she didn't just stop there. She continued to do her postgraduate studies. So you couldn't have invited a better candidate to come and share with us, to come and address us. She always shouts at people who do not respect the prescribed health protocols. As though we were doing her a favor, as though we're doing the president a favor. We're not doing them a favor we're saving ourselves, we're saving the loved ones next to us, and we're saving the South African community. 
just by observing those health protocols. Yes, MEC will say there is a vaccine most probably in a deep freezes at the hospital. That's not all. We dare not lower our guards. We'll continue safe distancing will continue wearing those masks in public places, will continue washing our hands regularly with soap, and will continue doing any other thing which will sanitize us, sanitize those next to us, and save us from the wrath of this pandemic. Honorable MEC, once more, thanks for agreeing to talk to the University of Limpopo community. And what I like about it, knowing Peladi, you will not be addressing just the University of Limpopo community. Your address will be there for the whole nation to hear your advice. Over to you, Honorable MBC. Thank you very much for such and those very kind words, getting them from your professor, it is quite encouraging. I would also want to join you, Prof, and, and appreciate the leadership that has been demonstrated by our TSRC, uh, and the entire collective we feel that this is what young people, especially who are in the institution of violence, must provide, um, and, and all the other young people in the community would therefore learn from you, uh, because it's only through knowledge that many of us will not perish. There are some of us who are perishing out there, not because they didn't want to, to listen and to be advised, but because they never had an opportunity to listen and to be advised through correct information. So I must really appreciate uh, this particular opportunity that you have given us, especially noting that sharing uh, this platform with you, it means I would be sharing with the entire academic community and also the other members of the community, because you are not just the member of the university or the academic center, you are also part and first of foremost, the members of the community. So let me really appreciate this invitation. I have been requested to talk the situational analysis where we are as a province in terms of COVID-19, because as a university, you are also part of the statistics that one will be talking about. And the prof has put it nicely. It's no longer statistics, it's no longer numbers. It's about our mothers, it's about our sisters, our brothers our own children that are forming part of all these thousands that we continuously talk about. Let me just uh, add on what Prof. indicated that as a province, when we were dealing with the first wave, probably it was because we were all scared or because we were given an opportunity to host our uh, repatriates who were mostly were students from China, from Wuhan, uh, where the, indeed it was the epicenter and where this, the, this virus, SARS-CoV-2, was um, discovered uh, because we were all scared about that. Uh, as a province, we were given that opportunity and we, we started to learn and study about this virus before any other person uh, because we never had any, any case in the country. Uh, so even though those students, it was clarified that they've been under quarantine for 58 days. Uh, there was still all the halabalu that why would the Mpopo government allow a corona to come to the province? Um, we have indicated at that time that if duty calls, we have to, and that did assist us because many of our people started to learn and understand the virus. We also, from a department point of view, and also the university component that's dealing with health sciences, which we have been working closely with them since then, we started to study the behavior of this virus. How, does, how do you contain it? How do you prevent it? 
And indeed, all the work that we, we did at that time, which simple summarize that if you want to defeat this virus, because it doesn't move, it's us who transmit it. You must quarantine. That is the key. And you must be disciplined in terms of quarantining yourself. You should be able to test. Once you test positive, all those who have been in your contact, whether they are positive or negative, quarantine them. Because of the incubation period of this virus, you wouldn't know when will it show the symptoms or show itself in the system. So quarantine. We started quarantining at 14 days. And the, as, as the research come to say, no, uh, seven days actually is enough. If you don't show any symptoms at that time, you might not be show them again. Ten days were, was shown as the safer days to say if ten days uh, passed, if you have tested positive and you have not fallen sick, chances are you will never be sick again. That's why after ten days, even those who are under isolation, we release them. So the battle was won with the first wave on testing, tracing the contracts, quarantine everybody who is a contract, isolating those who are positive. Those were the four key areas. It is very difficult to win this battle once you start entering your wards, your ICU. I, I must uh, tell you, it's very difficult. But it's, it's not as difficult to, to deal with it at these particular stages that I've indicated. So in our first wave, our approach was that. That is why you might have realized that last year we even went out to advise people to say it's not proper to come home. Uh, because we also learned from Wuhan that they defeated it by just uh, locking down Wuhan and make sure that there is a car that move out of that province. The Chinese government was even delivering food everything for those they were under quarantine and that's it and they dealt with the virus and and they defeated it now we passed the first wave without even feeling that we were on the first wave was i must indicate to to you that at that time i remember the the de date of a, around july where we were at peak the country was at peak of first wave when we check at our records, the, the specimen that were taken on the date of the peak, they were around 526 that tested positive out of all the other specimen. So we did not read uh, the virus in the province. I also remember when we're doing household screening, we screened more than 3,000, 3,700,000 people in the province and 4,000 were referred for testing. Only six came out positive. So that tells you that in the province, we did not even have community spread. And if you remember in July, we did not have death during that time. Because when you start to have uh, the, the, the virus really uh, increasing its, its existence in our community, you will start by seeing people, more people dying. We did not have such. I still remember media houses were saying maybe you're not reporting, you're hiding the positive cases. And I'm, I, I kept on saying, we have screened, we have tested. People are just negative because there is no community spread at that time. And then I think now people are starting to see exactly what we meant at that time. Now, fast forward, we come here to December to the second wave. We saw the second wave in Eastern Cape moving to Western Cape. We knew it was going to come to the province. We seen Gauteng and we made a plea that unfortunately, when the report came of a new variant, uh, this new variant, 501v2, we became worried to say the timing of this virus is really bad and unfortunate. The fact that it has been discovered in December when people will be coming back home to our province. And the fact that this type of variant, it's, it attacks even young people, even students, even children, compared to what we were dealing with during the first wave. It became an area of concern to us. We're saying this is a period where young people are no longer at school. Whether you want to agree with me or not, when you are at the university, 
uh, maybe I let me not use universities because they, a lot of things happen in the university. But when you are in an environment, actually when you are in the university and you are attending your lecture hall, you are safer than when you are outside the lecture, lecture hall. Even when our students were at school, they were more safer than when they were at home during school holidays. Even our teachers, they don't agree with me in these views, but even our teachers were more safer in the classroom than they were during the school holidays. We can argue and say all those, but the fact of the matter is, including myself, I'm more safer when I'm at work than when I'm here at, at, at my home. When I'm at my home, I don't know, my bedroom becomes even much more dangerous. I don't know where the other person was doing, what was happening. And it's gonna be very difficult to be wearing a mask when you're at home. You must have dinner with your family. You must have all that. You can't. So you eat out with them. You don't know where they were during the day. But when we are at work, we don't even want to touch each other. Actually, we don't even want we have taken it as a resolution that no one must touch a patient without proper uh, uh, PPEs. The PPEs must be dependent on what level are you. If you are like me and you are always visiting COVID-19 wards, because I don't visit the hospital without going to COVID-19 ward, you should at all times be provided with at least an N95 mask, a KN95 mask. That's why you see me wearing that mask because most of the time, I will start at the hospital, visit a hospital, and go to COVID ward. So I will use that particular mask throughout the day. So that is why I've, with the, the team resolved that I have to wear an N95 mask. So you can see that I am safe when it comes to that. But when you get home, you take off your PPEs, you are relaxed, you are in the company of your loved ones. So that's, that's why you saw numbers spiking. They, First reason was that we had uh, this variant coming at a wrong time. And we had a variant, variant that is very brutal, uh, which people who got infected became more sick than during the first wave. During the first wave, you would have people testing positive, the 526, only six of them warranting a probably admission, or even three would warrant admission. The rest of them will just say, I had a minor flu-like, and that's it, never even took any medication. They don't even show, and it was funny because at that time, it was during winter, we expected more people to be sick during that time because we thought uh, the whole situation would be compounded by the fact that we are in a flu season. But we didn't see uh, that happening. We only saw it happen in December. The 1st of December, the specimens that we have taken on that day, only 44 tested positive. On the 6th of December, the numbers started going down. Only 12 cases tested positive on the 6th of December. On the 13th of December, I remember I issued a statement on this. It was a weekend. I issued on the 12th or on the 11th of December. Many of you had finished your exams. You had come home. The high school, grade 12, had finished their exams. I still remember that weekend of the 11th and the 12th. We then even had to communicate that we are appealing to parents and to students to say, yes, we have done with our exams. We are excited. We're doing grade 12. Now we're waiting for results so that we go to university and freedom will be with us come January. We appealed to say, can we avoid the parties? We saw what happened at the rage, and we saw uh, the, the, the challenges that way the country faced after that. Even as a province, we started on the 13th of December, that weekend, seeing 33 cases. We never went backward from that day. Because from the 15th, you can see we jump. On the 15th of December, the specimen that way collected 161 tested positive. 15th December, we went into the 16th of December. It was now the holiday season was full blown now. We had all the functions, all the weddings. We had all the social gatherings. The numbers jumped from the 15th of December on the 24th of December. The specimens that we collected 
507 tested positive. That was on the 24th of December. It became very difficult now because on that day, our hospitals were full with drunken stab wounds, uh, drunken driving, all sorts of trauma. Our surgeons, you know, those that I felt pity was your anesthetist because they are also assisting us in the COVID patients when they require ventilation and intubation. At the same time, they are supposed to be ventilating the head injuries of road accidents or of any trauma. It was the hospital was bloody and there were also COVID patients. Now, the 30th, then the, the 28th of December, we also jumped. Uh, 31st of December, our numbers now started showing us flames. Because, okay, I remember the 28th of December, we jumped to 920. 32. 31st of December, we then crossed even the 1,000 mark. This was for the first time now. We moved to 1,352. And at that time, the president has just put us on level three lockdown, adjusted. But we felt it was, it was a little too late for, to, for some of us, but it did assist it. You will see now that that intervention did assist it. On the 4th of January, that's the day when we picked as a province. Our numbers picked on the 4th of January. The, the numbers that I've spoken about up to 31st of December, these are most of the cases which were infected because of our social gatherings, because of the parties that we're having. Some of us as young people will go to the party and you will come back. You don't think you are positive, you are fine, you are happy. Your mother fell sick. We admit your mother. When we admit your mother, we test her, she's positive. When we send the team home to tra do tracing, when we test you, you are positive. You don't have a symptoms, you are young, you are healthy. That's when you start to say, you know, I attended a party. And unfortunately, your mother will not make it. But you were lucky because of the nature of this virus. You, don't, you are still young, you are still healthy. So that's when we started to see more people now dying at that time. The cases that we have seen from the 4th of January going on was the cases as a result of the funeral. Now that those who, who, who died during the last week of December were being buried, we now started seeing more and more death now. From the 4th of January, uh, that's the day when we got the highest number, which is 2,591. It started to gradually slow down to the the 5th of January to 2,156, then the 6th January 2,038, then it goes down. Uh, these numbers figures might appear as if they are different from what you were seeing on a daily basis. Remember what, what we're reporting on the daily basis is not the specimen date. It's the date when, the, 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 when we receive the report. So usually when you hear that today there are one a hundred more death. That doesn't mean those people die today. That means it's the day wherein our team has been able to receive and, and collect the data. So what I'm currently giving you is the real uh, actual uh, date of when we had a peak. We peaked in this province on the 4th of January. And, and from there, then we start to gradually going, slowing down up until uh, today now, when today we will only report what we were given, which is not necessarily the, the, the specimen that were done yesterday. The specimen for yesterday will be much more lower than what we have. Uh, what we're having is 230 new cases registered in the, in the past 24 hours. But like I've indicated, it's, it's far lower than that. Some of these are the cases that were done previously. Our cumulative numbers as we speak today are at 58,313. And fortunately, we must also speak about the good news that out of that 58,000, 54,011 has already recovered fully. And then we are left with 2,225 that are still under isolation. We unfortunately, have seen a huge increase of number of deaths. These are not necessarily deaths that has happened now, 
These are deaths that has happened from last year, December. But because if you remember, especially those in the private hospitals, our three main big private hospitals are currently updating their statistics. We are now at 1,422 people who have lost their lives. The reason is why now reporting now, if those, you remember there was a time early in January where you would be told that you saw so many ashes lining up in a private hospital or in any government hospital. This was the, the time when we were really losing a lot of people. And at that time, the, the, the focus was on saving lives. And then we are now cleaning up our data and, and fixing it. I've just given you this background because, as Prof has indicated, we are out of the second wave. We, we, we are out, uh, be rest assured. But at the same time, when we are out of the second wave, the, the country had to move, economy has to, to grow. People have lost their jobs. Uh, some of us who went to school before you, we, we traveled using city to city bus buses using the payload, they've made us who we are today. But you see yesterday when I woke up to an announcement that uh, they are going to shut down, you can see the pain. How many parents now are going to lose their jobs? What is going to happen into their mental health state? They are going to go into depression because if you are no longer providing for your family, it's going to be very difficult. They are going to children can, won't be able to go to school because parents won't be able to afford. The, you are going to see a lot of domestic violence where if parents, especially male partners, when they can't cope with stress and they don't, are not provided with psychosocial uh, help, they will revolt into uh, violence. That's the, the how some human beings uh, 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 cope. That is why, as a department, uh, during the first wave, we launched what we called Psychosocial Hub. Its main focus was on our staff, especially those who were dealing with COVID. We needed them to get to adjust, to accept this new condition that they don't know, the fear of unknown going to work, not knowing whether you'll come out still negative or not. We also engage their children and their spouses, uh, provide counseling on everyone in the family to accept that my mother works in this particular hospital in the COVID, COVID world, that doesn't mean she's got COVID. We must accept her. If she feels she has been, today she made a mistake, she will isolate herself until that period uh, so that she protects all of us in the family. We did very well with the first, with the first round. Right now we are saying that psychosocial hub has been expanded now to the communities. We have now expanded it and brought in our team to say, let's not only focus on our staff, let's now work with social development. Let's be able to deploy all of us, social workers and everyone, virtually or not, you have read of an article of a family in Seshiru, which has lost so many family members just in one or two weeks, and they have to bury six of them at, at just like that. So, so that, those are the families that we come in and provide that psychosocial uh, therapy because the second pandemic that we're going to be dealing with is mental health. We have already started to see a number of depression as a result of this. And also some children who don't understand why should I cover my mouth every day I can't, and when I'm at school. It's those things that we need to also assist our children why they can't play anymore. We, we, we aren't dealing with that. This is the stage where we are in now because we are on, on we have we've passed stage six of medical care. We are now on bereavement and also the aftermath and also support on what uh, COVID-19 has done. We, we are now saying we are on stage eight. Stage eight, we are monitoring uh, the, the virus while waiting for the vaccine. We want to appreciate uh, the fact that we do finally have, have come into uh, the, the stage where, as a country, we have achieved what we wanted to achieve, which is uh, the vaccine. 
so so we we need to appreciate what a uh, government has done uh, in terms of getting vaccine because this is the stage which we have been waiting for even after the first wave we waited for the vaccine and unfortunately we went into a second wave before we could even get that vaccine vaccination it's part and parcel of primary prevention we have tried the behavioral change when i gave you this example of what has been happening in the background of the history i was trying to show you that behavioral change we have tried it even now we're still continuing with the behavioral change me messages yesterday we were, we were with a campaign which i became so much unpopular to say we the the, the alcohol has been unbanned now uh, the regulations have been relaxed but guess what even alcohol, uh, even the vaccine is not even the virus is not banned uh, regulations might have been relaxed but the virus it enjoys and thrives when the regulations have been relaxed when relax, re regulations are tightened uh, the virus does not is not able to perform nicely but now that we have relaxed the regulations that's when you are going to see its best form it so if we don't get another pre preventative methodology except behavioral change and we find ourselves in a third wave it is going to be very difficult to fight the third wave fighting the third wave with the staff that is already demoralized the morale is already very low these are people who have never seen holiday they have never been on leave i remember in the department when we thought we are out of the first wave we started the campaign to say let's go around clearing our surgical backlogs go to where the patients are while we were still busy with that we said hey let people just go two weeks and leave and then they will come back in January. Then again, the, the second wave came in. So you are dealing with that stuff that has never seen a, a holiday. They've been on work, at work throughout. And the, the worst part is that during the second wave, you had the, the challenges uh, that our healthcare workers, we started losing many of them in the country. We started to see more nurses dying, more and more doctors dying and more of your lecturers. I know those who are in the health sciences, at least I attended two uh, funerals of your lecturers in the health sciences. They, we started losing them. And, and, and I don't want to talk about those at the hospital level. We started losing a lot of people, a lot of key people in our country. And that is when one started to realize that if we don't get the vaccine before the third wave, there won't be anyone to treat anybody. And if there's no one to treat anybody, then it's going to be a serious disaster that we face ourselves in. Hence, you will see why when we get this virus, the important thing was to say we must start by looking at the phase one, which will be looking at the healthcare professionals. So in terms of the current vaccine, that we have received, which you, will, you would have seen. The, the vaccine has been, we have put up all the plans as the province and the provincial government. We have got different numbers of, of, of committees that serve under the search uh, committee of uh, COVID-19. I think Dr. Dombo, our DDG for health, is the one who is chairing that committee. But it also have got under it the technical working committee that is looking at the vaccine and also the training of those who will be providing the vaccine. To try to summarize how we and go to the, the nitty gritties, the practicality of this particular vaccine, we, we have received uh, the, you know, the famous Oxford AstraZeneca. Uh, this is a, a vaccine uh, that the Indian uh, government has been able to provide to us. You might have read in a number of papers that most of the countries says they will have to service their own people before they could allow any other country 
to receive the vaccine, but we must appreciate the Indian a government, which has been generous to be able to share with us as South Africans, so that this a million a, a doses that we have received as a country, they will be able to deal with our phase one, which I've already indicated why specifically, I would say in phase one must be healthcare workers. Uh, this uh, a, 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 a vaccine, which we call it COVID shield, um, it, its efficacy was seen to be between 62 and 90 percent. And it's, it's going to be administered intramuscularly uh, and also its storage. It's, it's the normal temperature, the 2 to 80 degrees, which this is the storage that we are. Uh, with a, a number of uh, vaccines that we are currently uh, using, uh, even the, the vaccines that we, we are, like today we were, we were uh, vaccinating our children. Uh, those vaccines are stored at that temperature. So we also have got uh, the, the famous, you've heard about the Moderna virus. Uh, Moderna also its storage it requires the two, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Moderna uh, virus. Uh, we are saying that if you are storing it at minus 20 degrees, it can last for more than six months. And it has been seen as efficacy of 94%. Uh, we also have got the Johnson & Johnson. Remember, we were told that Aspen will be producing this. Uh, together with Johnson & Johnson. The challenge with this is that it requires, I think, a, a, a also you, you, or it can stay for two years if you refrigerate, you freeze it at 20 degrees, but it also requires two to eight degrees, the storage capacity that we do have. The other positive thing about this one, the Johnson & Johnson was that you can, uh, uh, you only get, uh, I think they were indicating the issue of one dose also on that one. Uh, then the other one that the, the president spoke about, the Pfizer, uh, Pfizer, the challenge with the Pfizer is the minus 70 degrees, uh, that, that storage of minus 70 degrees that uh, it might be very difficult uh, to have. Uh, hence, we have requested our universities uh, to be assisting. And I think you guys will be much more relevant to start assisting uh, both uh, you, your university to assist so that when it arrives in the country, we will know that you would have developed uh, that minus 70 degrees so that we can, we can store uh, this uh, uh, vaccine. So... Otherwise, that, those are some of, of the vaccines that one can talk about. But what we have already received today, it's, it's, it's this uh, that is called the, the COVID shield. Uh, the COVID shield is the one that we, we have received. We also need to indicate uh, that this one million dosages that we have received, they will be uh distributed amongst our phase one uh, who are the frontliners focusing mainly on uh, categories that are dealing with uh, the the patient we it, it's what happened is that we have received 544,000 we have received i think 44,522 dosages um, um, let me correct it uh, we have received 44,520 uh, dosages. These are the, the dosages that we are going to be received in terms of the letter that we have received from the minister. They will be covering only for the, a, a dog, the, the patients, in the, the, the staff that is working directly with uh, COVID-19. These are the people who are within our PESAL system. These are also other support staff, for instance, your security guards, your admin clerks, your cleaners, those who are working in an environment which is exposed to COVID-19. 
I understand that the universities or institutions of higher learning through higher health, they will also be receiving because you also have got nursing students, you have also got medical students, we have got other pharmacy students that interact during their clinical practicals, your nutrition students, they must also be catered during this phase one. So I understand that higher education will also be receiving their own for, the, for instance, the other uh, sectors like your private hospitals, they have already, they will also, they've also received their, their letters. When I say received, I don't necessarily mean the vaccine itself, but the commitment letter from the Minister of Health, each and every employer would receive for their own employees. So the, 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 the current a vaccine that we've received, I've indicated we don't have a problem with the storage. The problem is with the Pfizer, which will require minus 70 degrees, uh, which you would require a much more, a, 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 I think, assistance from you guys to help us. And the other one, which require minus 20, you will also need to assist us with that. So, so basically, in the nutshell, those are the, the vaccines that we, we are going to be receiving. And we want to appreciate the government uh, that they've been able to do that. Now, that will be our phase one. We've also, we'll be looking at the human resources that will be assisting us in vaccinating. In terms of human resources, we've mobilized, we will requiring at least, we're saying 200 professional nurses who will be working with teams comprising of an enrolled nurse or a staff, staff nurse or, and then a community health care worker, also a security guard to look at the safety, a pharmacist. Now, that whole team, it's going to be augmented. We have already spoken to some of your, 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 your uh, for instance, the, our nursing colleges and your nursing students, uh, because this is part of their scope, uh, where they will be working with uh, in terms of vaccination, especially when we move to the community. When we are now doing this, the, the vaccinating of our, our employees, I think even the university clinic can be able to cope and, and vaccinate the health sciences students that are in the clinical years. The, the problem will become when we start vaccinating everyone in the community. This will be phase two and phase three. Phase two and phase three we would require much more human resources. We would require to mobilize. With phase one, we've also put a scenario to say, Phase one, let's say you, you, we are able to get the 200. Currently, we already secured 169 of those professional nurses that are ready. If you multiply, let's say we get 200, you might give each one a target of 100 uh, patient and people to vaccinate a day. In a, in a, in, in, in a day, uh, those 200 would have vaccinated 10,000. So in a week, in five days, we would have vaccinated the whole 50,000 of our employees because with the with the department of health employees we've got 44,000 and we have got also another uh, 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 what 44,000 we also have got another 6,000 6,000 extra it's people who are employed through contracts those are security guards uh, people working from NGOs your Red Cross your ANOVA some of them that we've deployed in your universities and Tibet colleges through us as the Department of Health, we still need to count them and vaccinate because they're dealing with the patient. So all we are saying is that we need, at least we have already made a motivation that while we appreciate the 44,000, we still need 6,000 more to can cover everyone who is directly dealing with the patient in the Limpopo uh, province. So if we do that, we will be fine. Now, once we are done with the vaccinating the frontliners or healthcare workers, the second phase we are moving towards vaccinating, starting with our uh, other essential workers, our police, our traffic officers, uh, our teachers, uh, I think your lecturers there who are not necessarily uh, dealing with uh, health sciences, they are also at, at frontliners because they are also dealing with you. Uh, we, we must be able to vaccinate and we have already and looked at their scenarios. And I think with that, uh, those ones, we managed to estimate the, the total to be somewhere around more 250,000. We, we are also going to be moving into, during the phase two, 
all those uh, senior citizens who are above 60 uh, we, with a lot of comorbidities, they need to be uh, prioritized. So I just need to, to, to verify the, the, the numbers of those in terms of how many, if, if I remember, I think we, we had uh, somewhere uh, around a, a, a 1.6 million, if I'm not mistaken, in terms of the estimation of that category of those who are uh, not necessary uh, 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 patients, uh, but they are above 60 and they have got comorbidities. We have looked at, at that. We are also saying uh, there are there are persons. Uh, let me just repeat. I've just seen the facts, not, uh, statistics. We are saying on phase two, phase two, phase one. I said we are going to deal with fifty thousand. Phase two, we are going to deal with two hundred and fifty thousand essential workers. These are the categories that I've already indicated. Again, in phase two. We have those persons who are around the congregate settings. We have estimated them to be at 110,000. We also have the persons and above the age of 60. They don't have any comorbidity, but they are above 60, whether they have comorbidity or not. Our estimation gives us 500,000. And then the persons above age of 80, with comorbidities. That's where we want you to assist us. That you must start in with your constituency. You have got your students that you know have got all other conditions. Our estimation gives us around 800,000. So those are the ones that we are going to vaccinate in phase two because we don't want them to be infected because faith, uh, uh, the first and the second wave show us that it preys on them. They, when this virus gets into them, they don't survive. So we are also again saying the total of phase two will be estimation at around 1.6 million. So if you add this 1.6 million to the first uh, phase one, which is around, when you look at the, the public sector only, it's 50,000. If we add with all the other sectors, it probably would come to somewhere around 60 to 70,000. Now, when you go to phase three, you will get the remaining 2.25 million. Uh, if you add all these millions, they are going to give you the 67% of the people of Limpopo whom we must cover at the end of the day. So this uh, uh, more than 18 years without mobilities, it's, it's those who some of, for some of them, you hear them talking about this vaccine is gonna kill us, this vaccine is going to do this to us, this vaccine, when we know very well that the vaccine is not going to do anything uh, to them. Because they know that their immune system is strong. They know that they are not vulnerable. Some of them are selfish. This is why they are saying all those things, because they are discouraging innocent people out there from being vaccinated. And we are saying, in order to defeat this virus, we must have what we call the herd immunity. Herd immunity means... We must vaccinate as many people as possible. Therefore, we'll be able to defeat it. So if we don't uh, vaccinate as many people as possible, we are still going to have a challenge. Because the fact of the matter, if you remember, Prof said, she said, he said to, I will still tell you that wear your mask even after vaccinating and all that. Because remember, this is a novel virus, which we are still studying it. And we are not saying vaccinating will give you 100% coverage. That's why we're giving you statistics to say it's between 62 and 95 percent. So I'm saying, let me give an example of you, Tebo or Tapelo, and, and or, or Peladi. You decide to say, I am young, Mina, I know the virus will not kill me. You then go and refuse to vaccinate. If you refuse to vaccinate, your mother or your grandmother has agreed to be vaccinated. But she's part of those whom, the, when we say 62%, yeah, it's effective on them. She's one of those that it's not effective on. 
what will happen to her when you come into contact with her? You think because there is, there, she has been vaccinated, she's safe. You, on the other hand, you have not been vaccinated. You are still going on and drinking and all that. You get infected. You're going to come and infect her. And then you get surprised and start to say, but this government she was just lying to us. We do not lie. The good thing about us is that we tell you that this is another format of primary prevention. It's just another methodology of augmenting behavioral change. It cannot be used alone on its own. It needs to be used with primary prevention. So that's why we are appealing to all, all the people. And we are saying let's have more messages of encouraging people to go and agree to be vaccinated. When we move to phase two, it's, it's the one where we are going to be very having difficulty because we will be vaccinating within the communities. Currently, we've got 39 sites that will be vaccinating in our hospitals and uh, some of our health centers. That's where we'll be focusing on. But phase two, all our clinics would be happy to be enrolled for vaccinating. We would be using all our even tents within the communities who are going to put them up so that we can vaccinate as many people as possible. And we want to believe that if we work hard as a province and vaccinate 67% of the population, this virus will be history. We will not have to deal with it again because each time when it comes, it will find that the community has been vaccinated. And I think on that note, I have tried to cover quite a number of huge topics. Uh, the topic that has happened from January 2020 to now in February. So I've covered the uh, 13 months of work that we have been doing since uh, the first uh, the declaration in, on the 19th of January by the World Health Organization that yes, this is a pandemic. We have a, now an outbreak of the novel virus, which later on was called and named SARS-CoV-2, which is responsible for a disease called COVID-19 and has taken quite a number of many people. Uh, they've died globally, not only in our province or in our country because of this particular pandemic. So we're saying together, if we work hard, we will be able to defeat this virus. Uh, let's continue with behavioral change. Very soon we'll be augmenting the behavioral change with a, a vaccination. The true primary prevention will take us a long way in dealing with this virus. And we think uh, by vaccinating, we'll be arming each other in order to fight this virus more. Let's remember to continue to sanitize and wear our mask at all times and practice social distance. And most importantly, uh, even when we are in our lecture halls, let's continue to practice social distance. Thank you very much, Prof. And once more, I really appreciate And that, ladies and gentlemen, was the MEC for Health in the province, Limpopo province, Dr. Popira Matuba, who has just given us um, a very detailed presentation on COVID-19, um, the second wave, as well as the vaccination rollout. Um, and we want to take really this opportunity as the TSRC to thank um, uh, the MEC uh, for creating time to speak to us and our fellow students at the University of Limpopo about um, the COVID-19 as well as um, uh, its second wave as well as vac uh, vaccination uh, rollout plan. Um, we thank you uh, very much, MEC. And um, <clears throat> we, we, we have really run out of time and um, I just want to take this opportunity to move to the next item on the agenda, which is a um, vote of thanks by the TSRC. Um, let me just take this opportunity as we conclude to first um, thank the uh, Vice Chancellor of the University of Limpopo, um, uh, Prof. Matlo Mukhalong, as well as the MEC of Health in the province, Dr. Pope Ramatuba, uh, again, um, the Dean of Student Affairs, uh, Dr. Uh, Masipa as well as uh, any other colleagues that are found within that particular department, because I've seen uh, uh, officials such as uh, uh, Mem Khonir uh, Limekwani, as well as, um, as, well as uh, uh, Director Melusi Ngumal. So 
I just want to take this opportunity on behalf of the TSRC to thank everybody uh, from that particular department of the institution. Um, but furthermore, uh, also take this opportunity to, uh, to thank the TSRC chairperson as well as the secretary for um, being actively involved in planning and presentation of this particular program today as we discuss COVID-19 in the province. And I think um, they have done um, well and they've done in fact proper to, to represent the TSRC. Um, it is also our wish as the TSRC to indicate that we are, we are very much willing to make our contributions towards the stopping of the, of the spread of COVID-19 uh, in the province and as well as in the institution of the University of Limpopo. And we, 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 we are really keen to be involved, to get involved, not only with COVID-19 issues, but also other matters that could have brought by uh, COVID-19, uh, particular lockdown, such as gender-based violence and others. We are really, 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 really keen and all members of the TSRC are, are, are here to, to make such contributions. Um, I think in, 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 in overall, we have had the presentation from the MEC and um, unfortunately we not be taking any questions or any comments, but however, students of the University of Limbaugh particularly are uh, allowed to raise any particular questions or comments that they have uh, through the any official of the TSRC and those questions or comments will be taken to the office of the MEC and the MEC will hopefully respond to such. I don't know if there is any other remaining issue but in as far as I know I think all has been done and we are ready to close uh, this program for today. Um, I just want to thank everybody else once again. Um, thank you and thank you and thank you. Let us ensure that each time we wear our masks, we, um, we, we, we wash our hands regularly, and then we practice social distancing so that not only ourselves will be saved, but our, our, our communities, our families, our parents, our friends, and everybody else. I thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Doctor. I think we'll be calling you again in future, and then um, that will be it. Thank you very much, TSRC, and those questions or comments will be taken to the office of the MEC, and the MEC will hopefully respond to such. I don't know if there is any other remaining issue, but in as far as I know, I think all has been done, and we are ready to close uh, this program for today. Um, I just want to thank everybody else once again. Um, thank you, and thank you, and thank you. Let us ensure that each time we wear our masks, we, um, we, we, we wash our hands regularly, and then we practice social distancing so that not only ourselves will be saved, but our, our, our communities, our families, our parents, our friends, and everybody else. I thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Doctor. I think we'll